Welcome to Poetry of Immigrants. We've got Fred on one camera. Thanks, Fred. We got Rich. And we have a third camera. And of course, Chris is our director. He's in the sound stage with Ken. We are so grateful to have the help we need to put on a show. And there's Frida Kahlo, a national treasure of Mexico. And we'll be able to talk about her painting a little bit. We're going south of the border, as we said last show, we're going down to Mexico, and we're gonna cover Cuba. We've got a couple of poets from Cuba that are contemporary. And um, we'll be spontaneous, too. So if we read our own poetry adjacent and in juxtaposition to famous poets, then maybe we're on our way. <laughs> so I want to give you a little setup, a little background. Um, first, I want to welcome Elaine Nadal again. On my left, she's a writer and educator. She holds a master's degree in liberal studies from Wesleyan University, has degrees in Spanish, secondary education, and fine arts, music. Wow, are we lucky today. And of course, Indeed. Gemma, co-host as well. Hello. Hello, does wonderful work with the Poetry Institute in New Haven. So welcome, come into our parlor. We have some wonderful musical poetry for you. And that's what Mexican poetry seems to be. I'm going to read a little intro, um, which is so, so perfect for the first few poems. Um, this is from an anthology of Mexican poetry, Octavio Paz, um, translated by Samuel Beckett, po about Mexican poetry. Every poem is a fiesta, a precipitate of page time, says Octavio Paz in his introduction to the history of Mexican poetry. We're going to hear from him. And then, in keeping with the remarks of Mr. Brown on the relative lack of popularity from which poetry suffers in our technologically advanced Western countries, he concludes that this fiesta of the mind has had to go into hiding in order to be able to say no to the intrusion of mass power in the soul. Ooh, we're gonna rebel today, and we've got some rebellious poets who speak in their own distinctive voices. And uh, sit with us while we explore common themes in the arc of life, we're going to talk about childhood earlier, Gary Soto, a Mexican poet, and what it means growing up in poverty. So we're going to hit death and dying at the end of the show. And um, one poet in particular, Reynaldo Arenas, catalogs his dying from HIV, AIDS. Um, and again, he's a Cuban emigre who escaped Castro's repression. And if we look at it um, through themes, we're able to tie poets together and also feel the full power of their emotional message. Speaking of emotions, I love the way you read, Elaine. Can you read something from your own work? Sure, I'll start with my words. Great. Um, okay, so this is my words. Inadequate fragments embedded with I, no puede ser, si se puede, pura vida. Lacking punctuation, misunderstood, tirelessly running on and on, syncopating along the way. Lo tengo todo pensado, pues a veces. Sometimes spontaneous, problem solving, compassionate. Bendito, don't you worry, cariño. Creative making my own spice. An unconventional lexicon embedded with made-up words. Feel free to stick in a comma, 
colon or parentheses if you'd like, but I'll shift it, dice it, mix it with spices. <laughs> Some sazón de achote, adobo, and cilantro. Fill it in your tongue. It doesn't matter if you like it. I do all the grinding, criticism crashing, barrier mashing, creating new parade. I have the pilon, and you can't borrow it or take it away because only I can understand it. What a clever way to teach your students punctuation. <laughs> oh, I know what you're up to. That was so smooth, so flowing. Thank you. Um, poetry's interesting that way. Many poets eschew punctuation. They feel free in a free verse form and a line to just breathe, and that's traditionally what happens. Yeah, for me this was important because um, being, you know, I have I, uh, and I, my multicultural identity. Yeah. Um, it was important for me to mix both languages and also. Uh, allude to the Spanish language because the Spanish language is very creative and it's very different in the sense that the order of the sentences can be subject, uh, verb, object, object, verb, subject, mm -hmm. so we can go anywhere. Um, and it extremely, it's extremely creative and also I wanted, um, for example, we can have double negatives in Spanish, yeah. where in English is you can't do that. And I remember growing up how difficult that was for me <laughs> because I would speak using double <laughs> double negatives, and I'm like, no, I can't. You know, I, I understand. It's just that I'm so used to. And it's kind of like in our language, using these double negatives, they emphasize and they dramatize, and it's 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 so beautiful. So for me, this poem was like combining um, all the cultures and, and just the beauty of it and, and all the spices that come with it. And the music. You never not use those negatives, right? <laughs> you never not use them. And in Russian, you must use double negatives. Go figure. What's wrong with English? Speaking as a student. <laughs> that poem also, when you talk about making up your own words it, it, and the making up your own flavors, it's really the same thing, how words and flavors blend when you're coming from a multicultural perspective. Yeah, I, I also want, I, I, for me it was very important to, to kind of like showcase the uh, creativity because it happens a lot in, in the music and in the writings uh, and making up words, that's all improvisation, which is a 21st century skill to be able to just create and use that creativity um, when, when you do your work, so. <laughs> what a wonderful figure of speech. <laughs> Spices as words. Good for you. Wow. How about another one? Sure. Your own. Um, yes. So this one is called Alas, and it's a longer poem. And it's, it's actually a way to honor my grandmother. Um, so it is more narrative based. It is more of a story. Uh, so this is Alas, which means wings. Um, by the way. Wings? Wings. Oh, yeah. nice. So, um, I was told I have her eyes, her thick brows. Didn't think much of it. We all have something of someone. My sister has Anna Natalia's smile. My brother has Uncle Silo's curly hair, back in the day when my uncle had hair. <laughs> I was just glad I didn't inherit Aunt Rosa's squared shape. We call her Nevera con patas fridge with legs. Not to her face, of course, but when she leaves the room to go to the bathroom or during dinner when she's not paying attention. I didn't notice her boxy shape until my father pointed it out and only started calling her that because everyone else did. Besides, it's a catchy name. Rosita, did you see the new magnet I got on the fridge? Get up and look at it. Father always has a funny remark until it's about you. You took out your brows? Que idiota. You have spaghettis, two skinny spaghettis on your face. Now I'm trying to get them back. Years of trimming and waxing have caused hairs to sprout above and below, but never in the right spot. My wings of a reina mora have lost most of their plumage, and she predicted it. Vas a dañar tus cejas. I don't understand how she did it, but she knew everything. I'd hide from her many times so he she wouldn't scrutinize my face 
and ask me about the party I went to, the class I was skipping, or the boy I was seeing. The night she was taken to the hospital, she said a prayer for the house, the people in it, the spirits dwelling. Because we needed guidance in learning to withstand, to fight against ourselves, our fears, insecurities, and hubris, while remaining at peace at the same time. I didn't see her death coming, but she knew. Even when we tried to convince her otherwise, don't worry, Abuela Flor, you'll be out of here soon, and we'll have a big feast with pernil, arroz con habichuelas, ensalada de papa, pasteles, and coquito, and we won't put alcohol on yours. We're going to eat so much, you'll see. We buried her on our island, honoring her last wish. She secures it for posterity so it doesn't run out of water because it can't run out of water. A drought doesn't last forever and feathers cannot do grow. I'm sorry if I'm choking up. <laughs> no, that's so moving. Oh, and grandmothers have such a big role in our lives. That's so beautiful. Oh, and that's in a sense where we're going today, from the arc of early childhood up to the moment of death, and uh, celebrating lives in between. Loved when you said the brow, the <laughs> unibrow. Look at Frida, Frida, she's known as the unibrow. <laughs> Can you believe it? And it's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful yes. face. Speaking of Frida, who is a Mexican painter and a wonderful, wonderful personality. She said, I had two tragedies in my life. The first was the bus, bus accident at seven and then Diego Rivera, <laughs> whom she <laughs> married twice. Oh my God. Here's Frida. Um, could you read some biographical words sure. and show her? Her picture, that's so stately, that, that picture, it's just so beautiful. So this is my, uh, my birth and it's uh, some information. My birth name is Magdalena Carmen Frida Calo y Calderon, but I often say I'm Frida, German for peace. My birthday is July 6th, 1907, but I often say I was born in 1910, daughter of the Mexican Revolution. My birthplace is my grandmother's house in Coyoacán, Mexico, but I often say I was born a block away in the U-shaped blue house of my childhood, a white building until I painted it deep blue. That captures Frida's independence. Well, I gotta show that. Isn't she beautiful? Yes. And she's always graced with flowers and colors. Um, she has another side. So this is called The Two Fridas, and these poems are by Carmen T. Bernier Grand. <clears throat> On the right, Frida Diego loves, the Frida wearing the Tejuana clothes he likes, the Frida whose heart is whole, the Frida clasping Diego's portrait as a child. On the left, the Frida Diego no longer loves, the Frida wearing the Victorian gown he dislikes, the Frida armed with surgical clamps trying to stop the flow of blood, trying to stop the flow of love. That's probably the most famous painting. Mm -hmm. At the end, um, she became very, very ill from all her surgeries and operations and, oh my goodness, a lifetime of uh, excruciating pain, and yet she stayed productive. For her last exhibition and show, she says, I'm going to show for my fans, even though she couldn't leave her bed. Carrie's really bad, yeah. Oh, what an image. Amazing. 
there she is, rolled in, right? Mm -hmm. In a hospital bed, greeting everyone for her last show. And then a few days later, she was dead. I had a great time in Tucson when I walked into the Tucson Art Museum. And there was photographs of Frida everywhere. Um, there's a, an Hungarian uh, photojournalist who followed her everywhere she went during her career and documented her. And there were maybe 500 photos of Frida uh, mounted and beautifully displayed throughout the Tucson Art Museum. So I went by each one. His name was Nagy, Hungarian. And there's a little bio with each telling what the occasion was, how excited she was, and also in terms of the two Fridas, the down times, and all those were captured too. Her pain on her face. Um, it was a very moving exhibit, and uh, I love the monograph, so I went home and wrote my own, but I can't find it these days. <laughs> <laughs> she made an impression on me. <laughs> so deep. In, in terms of her personality. Yeah. She also um, documented herself through a series of self-portraits that she's well known for. So her portraits over her you know, adult lifetime are quite interesting. They tell a story, though, yeah, huh? Yeah. Would you like me to read the poem that I wrote referring to her portrait? I would love okay. it. Okay. <laughs> because I thought that would be a, a good time. Her portrait, so, among many. Among many, among many, there was a portrait that caught my attention in uh, the um, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Ah. And it was, I had been there before and uh -huh. seen all the very iconic paintings from many famous artists. And uh, that day in particular, um, is, was just a few years ago, and everything had changed for one thing. So I'll, I'll talk about it. The title of this poem really refers to Salvador Dali and his soft watch painting. He did one, the original soft watch painting, The Persistence of Memory, oh, yeah. and then he did one 30 years later called The Insistent Intrusion of Chromosomes Precipitating the Disintegration of the Persistence of Memory. So I call Leave this it to Dolly. Right. So I call my poem The Insistent Intrusion of Chromosomes at the Museum of Modern Art. So this is your original poem. This is my original inspired poem. Inspired by the experience. Exactly. With Frida Kahlo in a cameo. Oh, good. Not since Yoko Ono released flies on its grounds has MoMA been so completely infested. This time by a mono-lensed horde of selfie perpetrators who swarm unchecked until severe proximity to the paintings sets off the occasional alarm. Backstep, tilt in, frame, click. In the persistence of memory, is it improved upon by the gratuitous insert insertion of oneself? Do I imagine the deflated beached whale's signature portrait of Dolly <laughs> draped clock-like in the middle of the painting, smirking ironically or wincing in outrage? Surely the surrealist landscape is one into which one should be wary of insertion. <laughs> yeah. The lone selfie stylist approaches Rousseau's sleeping gypsy. Backstep, creep in frame, click. Her grin intrudes at the precise moment she awakens the technicolor dream-coated woman and alerts the thirsty moon-drenched lion. Predator, prey, and deus ex iPhone. Backstep tilt in, runway pose, click, runway pose, click. By virtue of its size, Monet's water lilies invites those particularly self-selected selfies to fan out so that they may self-engage simultaneously, as when they recently participated in the wine-drinking painting party, where the results were similarly and identically murky and derivative. The starry night selfie aspirants cue in motley devotional procession, each with their ears intact and no razor on hand to proffer. Click, 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 click into the swirling vast and starry sky. 
How curious. So many selfies braving Christina's world. And how marvelous. Her melancholy isolation is not compromised by this newfound virtual camaraderie. Tilt in, tilt upward toward the horizon. Click. Uh, but Frida, so avant-garde. Almost a century before the selfie invasion, she provided her friend Mary Sklar with a frame containing a mirror, identical to the frame into which she put her self-portrait, Fu Long Chang and I, so that her friend could pose next to Ms. Kahlo and her monkey, all three together on the wall. Pity that the selfie crowd fails to employ this visionary innovation. They tilt into her frame, obscuring her prophetic brilliance, obscuring her beloved monkey at her side. Back step, tilt in frame, obscure, click. Would Frida have scorned these monomaniacals, clueless selfies, or forgiven them? A pity we cannot ask Diego. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you did that justice. That was really good. And especially in terms of the intro I read about Mexican poetry. Say no to technological advancements. Yes. Oh, that was so perfect. <laughs> um, Mexican poetry has a range. And as we mentioned, we're following the arc of life, the rhythm of life today from early childhood to grandparents, beloved grandparents and dying. There's also the issues that come up of race and class. And that's an important framework for us, especially today, because I was sitting back thinking of the poets generally, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, this fellow is brought up on a farm. He's writing about having no shoes at the dinner table. Oh, if I can just get my brother and sister to wear shoes at the dinner table. And then there's another poet who will visit in the second half, who I think has a middle class background. Um, Cuban families who had the money were able to get out uh, early from Castro's um, increasing violence and repression. So it depended upon your background, what your freedom was. Gary Soto's quite a guy. He is one of my favorite poets. I anthologized him without knowing that it was in his autobiography called Living Up the Street, and it's about his early childhood. And uh, I'll just give you a snippet of his life and career. Soto was born to Mexican-American parents, Manuel and Angie. In his youth, he worked in the fields of the San Joaquin Valley. Soto's father died in 1957 when he was five years old. As his family had to struggle to find work, he had little time or of encouragement in his studies, hence he was not a good student. Soto notes that in spite of his early academic record, while at high school, he found an interest in poetry through writers such as Ernest Hemingway, John Steinbeck, Jules Verne, Robert Frost, Thornton Wilder, maybe some of those are his mentors, mentors who teach us our craft. Um, I'm going to read the first page of Living Up the Street, which is gripping. Um, it's a chapter entitled, Being Mean. We were terrible kids, I think. My brother, sister, and I felt a general meanness begin to surface from our tiny souls while living on Braley Street, which was in the middle of industrial Fresno. Across the street was Coleman 
pickles, while on the right was a junkyard that dealt in metals, aluminum, iron, sheet metal, and the copper stripped from refrigerators. Down the street was sun-made raisin, where a concrete tower rose above the scraggly sycamores that lined Braley Street. Many of our family worked at SunMade. Grandfather, grandmother, father, three uncles, an aunt, and even a dog whose job was to accompany my grandfather, a security guard, on patrol. I've chosen a poem that describes some of his childhood experience growing up along the canal. And I'd like you to um, just look along with me because it's easier sometimes to have the words in front of you to see what the craft is doing. And I'll read this aloud. Gary Soto, Saturday at the Canal. I was hoping to be happy by 17. School was a sharp check mark in the roll book. An obnoxious tuba playing at noon because our team was going to win at night. The teachers were too close to dying to understand. The hallway stank of poor grades and unwashed hair. Thus a friend and I sat watching the water on Saturday. Neither of us taking, talking much, just warming ourselves by hurling large rocks at the dusty ground and feeling awful because San Francisco was a postcard on a bedroom wall. We wanted to go there, hitchhike under the last migrating birds and be with people who knew more than three chords on a guitar. We didn't drink or smoke, but our hair was shoulder length, wild when the wind picked up and the shadows of this loneliness gripped loose dirt. By bus or car, by the sway of train over a long bridge, we wanted to get out. The years froze as we sat on the bank. Our eyes followed the water, white-tipped but dark underneath, racing out of town. He covers in this little autobiography, Living Up the Street, uh, birth to about um, late 20s when he became a teacher. And the section I anthologized is um, called One Last Time. And it's about work in the farmyard and also um, in the fields where Mexican-Americans worked long hours, low pay, and struggled to make family, families stay together. Yesterday, I saw the movie Gandhi and recognized a few of the people, not in the theater, but in the film. I saw my relatives, dusty and thin as sparrows, returning from the fields with hoes balanced on their shoulders. The workers were squinting, eyes small and vain, and were using their hands to say what there was to say to those in the audience with popcorn and Cokes. I didn't have anything, though. I sat thinking of my family and their years in the fields, beginning with grandmother who came to the United States after the Mexican Revolution to settle in Fresno where she met her husband and bore children, many of them. That's 1910, the Mexican Revolution. Grandfather worked in the fields, too. Mother and I got up before dawn and ate quick bowls of cereal. This is one last time. He decides, in order to save some money for new clothes for fall, for school starting, he was actually going to go back to the fields with mom. She drove in silence while I rambled on how everything was now solved, how I was going to make enough money to end our misery and even buy her a beautiful copper teapot, the one I had shown her in Long's Drugs, 
When we arrived, I was frisky and ready to go. I cut another bunch, then another, fighting the snap and whip of vines. After 10 minutes of groping for grapes, my first pan brimmed with bunches. I poured them on the paper tray. Are you tired, she asked. No, but I got a sliver from the frame, I told her. I showed her the web of skin between my thumb and index finger. She wrinkled her forehead and said it was nothing. How many trays did you do? I looked straight ahead, not answering at first. I recounted in my mind the whole morning of bend, cut, pour, again and again before answering a feeble 37. No elaboration, no detail. Without looking at me, she told me how many she had done, how she had done field work in Texas and Michigan as a child. But I had a difficult time listening to her stories. Finally, I rose and walked slowly back to where I had left off, again kneeling under the vine and fixing the pan under bunches of grapes. By that time, 11.30, the sun was over my shoulder and made me squint and think of the pool at the YMCA. He's a great narrative artist and poet and um, made his way under the influence of fellow poets to become a MFA and a teacher. And um, he's still with us. He was born in 1952. His dad died in 1957. I love Gary Soto because he's so accessible as a poet and very clear and direct in his prose, too. So, um, who would you like to read from Mexico? Anybody else? Did you bring anything from? I've got this poem, Manuel Ulasia. Remember I started to? Yeah. Yes. And um, I'm going to ask you, because your voice is so, so musical. Um, the stone at the bottom, but we'll do it at the first thing in the second half. Right. Fantastic. So we're going to take a break. Yes. Wonderful. Adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. As it turns out, we have very similar personalities. And this cat makes me make art because he's always motivating me to take pictures of him, to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. It's just that simple. Well, he's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Kids will spend 15 minutes watching online videos like this one. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. You can come out now. It's okay. Besides, it'll all be over before you know it. <laughs> Honey, you promised. We need the space. Dad, sometimes we all have to learn to let it go. Need to let go of a few things? Drop them off at Goodwill and make room for a good cause. We are back with sugarcane and fields in Mexico. And uh, we have a poem that Elaine will read 
just the intro of, which was so powerful for me two sessions ago. And I wanted to hear it again in another voice. By the way, I think it's a good idea always to allow someone else to read in his or her voice your own original work too. Um, it's better than the mirror. <laughs> and um, you discover new things. So we can do that as the shows progress. Oh, what an interesting idea. I like that. Yeah. It does work. Yeah. Um, brings out a lot of new things, too. Thanks. Yeah. So, Manuel Ulasio. So this is the stone at the bottom. As my father's breathing fails little by little, the probes and needles and oxygen mask removed. Between systole and diastole, on the stage of memory, one after another, the images like photos come to life. The trip to school at 8 a.m. with its enigmas of the Yellow River, the gardens of Mesopotamia, the Great Wall in Newton's Apple, and later at recess, while talking with other children in the cool shade of tall trees, the image of my father transformed into the author of heroic feats. Oh, thank you. That is so wonderful because it does link the early childhood experience and the dying parent. And also um, is poignant in the sense that it points to grandparents who die on us. And our memories somehow are triggered in those special moments. Your poem especially showed that. But he, throughout this poem, goes back and forth. And he repeats a phrase called, as my father's breathing fails little by little. And it's like a bell, a, no, a no, knelling of the bell. You know, Ask not for whom the bell tolls, right? John Donne, it tolls for thee. Did I say that correctly? I think you did. Yeah. Um, thanks. So, born in Mexico City, where he still lives and teaches, yes. Manuel Ulasia first studied to become an architect and later pursued his graduate studies in literature at Yale, down the road here, where his dissertation dealt in part with his grandfather, the distinguished poet Manuel Alto Laguerre. So, that's also the tradition in the family. How wonderful. Thank you for reading that. And what have you got for sugar cane? Uh, well, I'll read it in Spanish first. This is Good. From, uh, Judith Ortiz Kofer, uh, and she's from Puerto Rico, Puerto and Rico. it's called Alexión de la Caña de Azúcar. Mi madre abrió bien los ojos a la orilla del campo, listo para el corte. Respira hondo, susurró. No hay nada más dulce. Al escucharla, papá dejó la goma vacía que cambiaba bajo el sol que pandeaba la carretera. Y agarrándome por el brazo, interrumpió mi carrera hacia una caña. La caña puede ahogar a una niñita. Las culebras se esconden donde crece a la altura de tu cabeza. Y nos llevó hasta el carro inutilizado donde sudamos nuestra penitencia por habernos antojado de más dulzura de la que se nos permitía, más de la que podíamos controlar. And I have the English translation. Um, the lesson of the sugar cane. My mother opened her eyes wide at the edge of the field, ready for cutting. Take a deep breath, she whispered. There's nothing as sweet, nada más dulce. Overhearing, father left the flat he was changing in the road warping sun, and grabbing my arm, broke my sprint toward a stalk. Cain can choke a little girl. Snakes hide where it grows over your head. And he led us back to the crippled car where we sweated out our penitence for having craved more sweetness than we were allowed, more 
than we could handle. Mm. So that's due to these coal fire <laughs> Marvelous. Um, road warping. Wow. Uh, early childhood, growing up in the fields, watching parents uh, and their hard labor. So if we put a grid on, on poems that we're reading the second half here in terms of race and class, let's try to be aware of what is farm work, migrants, um, and refugees who do this work regularly in our country. And also, those who were born into the middle class who have a, a different lifestyle and a different freedom of choice. Um, we've had Gary Soto, Mexican-American poet, who um, echoed those, those early beginnings in the fields. Uh, what, what role does sugarcane play in the economy of the Caribbean? Um, we did a show on Haiti, ran into a friend, and we had posters, paintings, and the beauty of the art of Haiti. And um, he asked me, well, what was Haiti like in the early pre-colonial days and colonial days? I said, you may not realize it, but Haiti was the richest colony in the Western Hemisphere in the 1800s, 1700s. Um, and then the French planters came, and of course, um, they, they really expropriated a lot of the land of the natives. So talk of reparations and all the economies have gone up and down, but is it all sugarcane? Is that the industry that, that really created all the wealth in the first place? Just a, a question of sociology, I think in terms of race and class. I think um, where in Haiti and Dominican Republic, the sugar cane production was different and even the way they handled um, the workers uh, were different, which is why Dominican Republic oh, right yeah. now is doing much differently than Haiti and also um, who took over um, because it's two different uh, identities. The Dominican Republic uh, pretty much uh, recognizes the Spanish section where Haiti uh, recognizes a lot of the black section. Of, of, and so I, it depends who you, who you ask with the sugar cane and also who gets the money, right? Which doesn't go to the people, it goes pretty much to those that, uh, to, I guess, the, um, the one percent. Yeah, that what the one percent, yeah. and I mean the the poverty yeah. is is just is so heartbreaking. It is um, heartbreaking. And and when you look at those two, but sugar cane, the thing is out of that. Um, because it impacted so many people and, and then it carries through through generations. Uh, sugar cane plays a role. The suffering that happened uh, to the sugar cane, the mixing of cultures that yeah. happened to the sugar cane, which in turn um, it has influenced the art. We talk about uh, a lot in uh, the Caribbean, specifically the Afro-Cuban identity, the African um, influence in Puerto Rico, which it, it has done so much uh, for our foods, our, our music, etc. Now the sweetness and the bitterness of the, the two parents' point of view in that poem. Wasn't it, though? Yeah. Very nice. Extremely important, because you had mentioned fiesta at, yeah. the, at the beginning. And there is this, it, it, me teaching Spanish and just talking to people, there's this misconception that says, oh, you know, the fiesta notion. But the idea is that it is a mix of bitter and sweet, mm. right, uh, that creates these experiences. We wouldn't need happy songs. We wouldn't need fiesta if there wasn't any suffering. Mm -hmm. So it is a way of, like, alleviating wow. and getting everything together. Together. That's why there's so much. We're suffering, mm -hmm. uh, and in turn, we we kind of we have to be survivors. We push on, uh, and and that is Frida too. Important, yeah, uh, in the culture, extremely important. That's a, such a good insight into the culture, uh, based also on the context of of the economy. I love the the play with too much sweetness in that poem you read. In other words, it's um, it's almost a, a metaphor for. 
trying to think, tease it out. I couldn't quite, but it was such a, such a wonderful little bell. Too much sweetness gets you in trouble. Yeah, and the blend. So poverty, let's um, go from Puerto Rico right to Cuba. And I'd like to read the first page of Reynaldo Arenas, who um, grew up on the, the dirt, the farm, in a remote section of Cuba. Um, and that is from a book called Before Night Falls. I'm uh, going to talk about, in the last 10 minutes here, two Cuban poets. And the first one, older generation, um, died of AIDS in 91. Uh, and his uh, first words, again, this is like the arc of birth to death, fascinating. Um, in the intro, he says, the end. I thought I was going to die in the winter of 87. For months on end, I had been having terrible fevers. I finally went to a doctor, and he told me I had AIDS. Feeling worse every day, I bought a plane ticket from New York to Miami and decided to die close to the sea, not exactly in Miami, but at the beach. However, due to some diabolical bureaucracy, everything we desire seems to be slow in coming, even death. Um, back to age two. I was two. I was standing there naked. I bent down and licked the earth. The first taste I remember is the taste of the earth. I used to eat dirt with my cousin, Dulce Maria, who was also two. I was a skinny kid with a distended belly full of worms from eating so much dirt. We ate dirt in the shed. The shed was the place next to the house where the animals slept. That is, the horses, the cows, the pigs, the chickens, and the sheep. Um, not a good place to eat dirt. Not a good place to eat dirt. The, the farm animals, the barn animals, almost like domestic enclosure, people and animals all, all in one. He, he documents this and shows um, his pluck and spirit and fighting spirit, which we're, you were just talking about in a sense, the sweet, the sour, the power to hold adversity at bay and allow your soul to be nourished and to, to fight, to win, to become the poet. Uh, so let's hear one of his poems and also the translation. I'd be interested in that. And you have it. And it is Autumn presents me with a leaf. I'll do the English. You have to. Okay. There you go. Autumn presents me with a leaf, trembling like a supplicant, I imagine. It's just fallen beside me. Final flame dissolving, a leaf demands my closest attention, my most generous devotion. Autumn presents me with a leaf, remote fragrance, final blush. Its only branch is the unlikely gaze of a passerby. Its only salvation is my farewell. A leaf, in desperation, tries to lodge itself in my breast. It wants the gentle greeting of the vagabond, the fraternal gaze of the condemned man the warm complicity of the curse. But what can I do with it if my restless life of a visiting professor barely allows me to collect textbooks? Indifferent to my justifications, frail and stubborn as hope, it has to be sheltered by my fingers. But what can I do with this specter that pales before me, detached from the vital tree? On the other hand, I'm a specialist in 19th century Cuban literature. I know nothing about botany. Autumn presents me with a leaf that without much fanfare takes hold of me and turns me in, into a sheet of paper, compels me to draw on my self-portrait. Autumn presents me with a leaf, a blank sheet of paper, infinite homeland of the exile, 
where all the furies whirl. Autumn presents me with a leaf. Uh, Ithaca, October 1885, so he was well on his way to illness with HIV. What does that sound like in Spanish? I'm so fascinated by repetitive sounds and phrases being repeated over, again, like that bell. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. So he's facing, in a sense, his death here, isn't he? Early autumn, a leaf. I'm not a botanist. What does it sound like in Spanish? El otoño me regala una hoja. El otoño me regala una hoja. Con temblor que imagino suplicante, acaba de caer junto a mí. Última llama que se disuelve, una hoja reclama mi atención más exacta, mi más desprendida devoción. El otoño me regala una hoja, remota fragancia, final rubor. No tiene otra rama que la improbable mirada de un transeúnte. No cuenta con otra salvación que mi despedida. Una hoja desesperadamente pretende instalarse en mi pecho. Quiere el leve saludo del vagabundo, la hermana mirada del condenado, la cálida complicidad de la maldición. Pero, ¿qué puede hacer con ella si mi temeraria vida de profesor visitante apenas se me permite coleccionar libros de texto? Indiferente a mis justificaciones, frágil y terca como la esperanza, pide ser acogida por mis dedos. Pero, ¿qué puedo hacer con ese espectro que ante mí empalidece desprendido del árbol vital? Por otra parte, yo me especializo en literatura cubana del siglo XIX. Nada sé de botánica. El otoño me regala una hoja que sin mayores trámites se apodera de mí y convertida ya en hoja de papel, me obliga a dibujar en ella mi autorretrato. El otoño me regala una hoja, una hoja blanca de papel, patria infinita del desterrado donde todas las furias se arremolinan. El otoño me regala una hoja. Más, más. Wow. I heard the repetitive phrase. I could pick that up. I only speak one word of Spanish. I heard that phrase <laughs> over and over. And that, that leaf, it's as his sheet of blank paper, it's just asking him to, mm. to observe and record the culmination of the tree's life cycle. Wow. Of, of his life cycle, as he knows it's coming to a close. Isn't that a beautiful juxtaposition yeah. there? Thank you. That was so musical. This is what I miss in English. Um, wow. So we're down to two minutes. And um, I, I think rather than read a Richard Blanco, who's middle class. This guy obviously was born in the animal barn. and had to fight his way up. Richard Blanco um, read at President Obama's second inauguration. Yeah. And geez, born in Spain. His Cuban parents got out from under Fidel, went to Spain, was born. And then a few months later, they came to New York. And so he's, um, he's in exile. And yet, he's got. Um, a search for home so deeply embedded in his soul that his other collection, a wonderful collection, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, that means he traveled the world looking for home, his longing, which happened when his parents left Cuba. Um, so that'd be a great intro next time. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We are co-producers, <laughs> we are um, spontaneous, and uh, we welcome the audience to, uh, to enjoy how musical and entertaining lyric verse is, and also narrative poetry. Uh, thanks again, I had a wonderful time. Um, I can't wait for the music trailer. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for joining us, and thanks to our team. <laughs> Thank you. And a great time. Thanks. <laughs> I did too. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>